Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Reading Party Podcast with Megan and Lexi. This episode continues our season looking at stories inspired by or set in ancient Egypt. Some of the material includes themes of violence or sexual assault. It is not suitable for under 18s. We hope you have your favourite beverages and snacks ready to go, because we've got our teas and are ready to start spilling the tea on our latest ancient story. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Reading Party podcast, season two, our Egyptological extravaganza. Today we're talking about one of the mummy films, and it's not the mummy that you immediately think of because it's what I immediately thought of when we were putting together our media list. It is the 2017 mummy with Tom Cruise, which I hadn't watched prior to preparing for this episode. And Jill, our expert today, had not watched it either, but she is an aficionado of the original three. Original three? Two. Three? Well, I mean, there are three, but we only count two of them. Okay, cool. (laughs) Those in the know think it's a two-part thing instead of a three, and definitely not a four-part thing, because this is, except for one very brief moment, completely unrelated to the movies that we all know and love with the amazing Brandon Fraser. But before we get into that, Jill. Hi! Jill is like a best awesome friend from when we were both in grad school. I haven't seen or spoken to her for a long time. So this is super cool for me. I'm very excited to have you here. But could you please tell everyone who you are and what your specialism is in Egyptology? Sure. So I got my PhD last year from Johns Hopkins University, where I was a grad student with Megan. I specialize mainly in material from tombs, specifically from the Middle Kingdom through the early New Kingdom period. The site that I most work on is called Naga Ed Dare. But for that, I work mainly with like archival material, but I have also excavated in Egypt. Thank you. And what were your, so I'll, I usually do like a, a summary of the movie or book or whatever. I'll do that in a minute. I wanted to know what your first impressions were when I asked you to watch this for me. Yeah, well, like you, I had not actually watched this movie yet, partially because, yeah, the first two, which actually they're calling them the first two, they're not actually, I don't think, related cinematically, as you mentioned, so they're not supposed to be in the same series, but The Mummy from 1999 with Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz, that is one of my favorites, as is The Mummy Returns. Yeah, again, the Tomb of the Emperor, the one in China, we don't count. But yeah, this one, I understand why it got panned. (laughs) I do love a lot of Tom Cruise movies, but I think after watching this, he should probably stick to Mission Impossible and Top Gun and what he (laughs) is familiar with. I definitely feel like this was a a step away from his tried and tested genres. Did he direct this as well? I feel like he directed this. I'm not quite sure if he directed, but I've read a lot that he had strong creative license. So also what the film was originally supposed to be was not what it ended up being because he changed a lot in order for him to actually be in it. That was one of his demands. Interesting. I did a quick Google. He didn't actually direct it. I'm thinking of something else. But yes, I enjoyed it for what it was. It is not the best film I've ever seen, and it is not the best Egyptian reception I think I've ever seen. Lexi, what were your thoughts? I saw this before, and I've actually, I've deemed it entertaining enough to see multiple times, because this would actually be about the third or fourth time I've seen it. From a historical or Egyptological perspective, it's terrible. But to me, it's one of those, like, it's so bad that it's good. And I may be affected by the fact that the actress who plays what's her name jane Ominous. oh no jenny jenny jenny, jenny, jenny thank you oh, i always forget her name jenny that's annabelle wallace and i connect her so strongly because she played oh that's why i was thinking yeah she played jane seymour in the tutors 
And oh. I absolutely loved her in that role yeah. and like thought she was like the sweetest little dove. And so to see her in this role, I was like, oh my God, her acting chops are so good because she went from like dainty little thing to like badass woman. And I was like, okay, amazing. And then also, yes, the one who plays the mummy is Sophia Butella. And I've seen her in, she was in Atomic Blonde with Charlize Theron. And I was like, I love you. So because it's filled with people that I actually like, it's very hard for me to just be like, this sucked. That's like a reoccurring thing, though. But also, I should just go on record. I, I generally don't like Tom Cruise movies at all. I don't like Tom Cruise. I think he's a wooden actor. And maybe some of that is like bleed through from my brother-in-law. He was a New York Times film critic. And so I grew up like watching movies with him or talking to him about it. And we would just talk about how Tom Cruise was a shitty actor, man. But, you know, I guess he was bankable. And I don't really know how that happened, but it did. So I skipped all the mavericks and the mission impossibles because those just don't interest me so for me i was like eh, Tom cruise makes it meh but you know so i was kind of like just you could replace him with someone else and it'd be just fine but the rest was fine yeah you know mommy's curse i was like okay i actually really like the uh sandstorm thing that they got going on that was a pretty cool bit of visual effects and then like the weird egyptian dreams as well i don't really know why we had this like king arthur type of tomb thing in the uk later but we're just mixing genres at this point and again it's just, it's, so it's a fact that london is so old that you can just like throw a stone dig where the stone lands and you'll find some kind of like crusader temple or something well yeah that was actually one of the most realistic things that yeah a construction project unearthed the site that would happen that would totally happen but yeah, yeah, a lot of the... Just why is it here? <laughs> you know, I'm like, we're talking crusaders, and it's like, Egypt. Egypt. Guys. Yeah. Well, even, I mean, why is the original tomb in Mesopotamia? That, like, yeah, that was... Mm. They said it was to punish her that she couldn't be buried on Egyptian soil, which, okay, yeah, that does kind of have some roots in Egyptian culture. Like, even the story of Sinue, he talks about wanting to come back to Egypt to be buried there. It's a huge thing. You want to be buried at home. But we don't really have records of people not being allowed to be buried in Egypt. Or If you were any... looking for that kind of punishment, would you just, like, not bury someone? Yeah, it would be more like, and especially you would not mummify them. The entire point of mummification is to preserve the body and keep them having a vessel for them to continue in the afterlife. If you're punishing them, the worst thing in ancient Egyptian culture or religion was to just not have an afterlife. For your heart to be eaten by, uh, and her name is completely out of my head, but there's a monster that eats your heart if you're bad in life. And then you just, end, end of story, you don't get an afterlife absolute worst thing that could possibly happen. Amut is her name. Yeah, Amut, which is a monster with a crocodile head, the front of a lion, and the back of a hippo. But yeah, if your heart in... Now what I'm talking about is also New Kingdom, like Book of the Dead. If your heart does not pass the weighing of the heart, if it's heavier than the feather of Ma'at, the goddess of truth and justice, then your heart gets eaten. And end of story. You don't get an afterlife. That is the worst thing that can happen. Obviously they couldn't do that with Amunet because she was not actually dead but yeah yeah no that's, but that's it's interesting also bizarre that you would do any sort of mummification to preserve her in any way that was something that you wanted not a punishment interesting we even have mummies that they're somewhat preserved but they clearly weren't mummified properly as part of a punishment so it's like you will have an afterlife but your body is not going to be as perfect as it could be well, like, for example, there's a mummy, which also the identity has been slightly debated, identified through DNA analysis with Dr. Hawass's, Dr. Zahi Hawass's project for DNA in the New Kingdom. There is a mummy which has been deemed the screaming mummy from how it looks, but it's also wrapped in a particular type of animal skin, possibly goat skin, and not properly mummified. And through DNA analysis, Dr. Hawass has suggested that this was a son of Ramses III, and therefore possibly even the son who led the harem conspiracy to assassinate Ramses III or steal the throne. So that's something that we would have seen, not, not this like, full total, on mummification yeah. Yeah, and trying to preserve her. I'm going to do my quick rundown so everyone can at least try and follow where we are because we jump oh, around yes. in the plot. but. I have like a, a whole list of questions for you because as I was watching, I was like, huh, this seems odd. I don't think this is correct. This is interesting, but 
I need Jill's input on this. So we open with a couple of American soldiers somewhere in a desert. We find out later it's Iraq and they are looters, which that kind of smacked me around the face as an mm. Assyriologist who has spent a long time bemoaning and wailing about lost antiquities from people looting Mesopotamia. But they're there. They stole a letter from an archaeologist who we meet later. She's Jenny. She's the main love interest. They stole a letter from her and have decided to just go and find whatever it is she was looking for themselves and then sell it because that's an absolutely reasonable thing that you want your hero to be doing. Interesting character choices. Very interesting in this movie. They end up calling in an airstrike, find this massive burial site with huge statues and a coffin suspended in mercury, which... Yeah, that's yeah. like a, that's like that a was Chinese a lot of mercury. thing. I was like, isn't it like a Chinese thing where like the dragon emperor yeah, was like, I believe is. in mercury, not an Egyptian thing. So I was like, why is there mercury? Yeah, mercury was definitely not an Egyptian thing. I mean, there is some evidence of cinnabar, mercury sulfide, but yeah, no, mercury as like, especially a liquid metal. No, not a okay. thing. And even Good. cinnabar was not really used that much until like Ptolemaic period. So excellent. Sorry. No, no, that answered one of my questions. Thank you. So they, the three of them end up going down and then there's this spider that bites one of the guys, like Tom Cruise's best buddy. And you're like, oh, that doesn't look good. And Tom Cruise is like, it's just a camel spider. It's not even poisonous. And you're like, oh, well, that's like, you are dead, friend. So if I know anything about Hollywood, you are now dead. So they end up taking the coffin that's suspended in, in the Mercury, putting it on a helicopter, flying it to London. Totally legal. <laughs> Oh my totally God, legal. They, they broke so many international laws. And why an American military force is flying to London? I mean, I don't know if they were deliberately flying to London or if they were going to the US via the UK. It was a little confusing. It did sound like they ended up there accidentally because, I mean, they even made a point of saying that Aminat got them there to get to the dagger, which was okay, magically good. in London. Thank you. Well, which was brought by the Crusaders in London. So she intentionally brought it down there. Excellent. So. Okay, good. So it wasn't a deliberate London trip, but still, they were removing antiques, cultural heritage with, like, no, yeah. Anyway, there's a lot of things that go into being allowed to remove things from their country of origin, and they did none of them. And on the plane, Tom Cruise's friend tries to kill everyone and is clearly like a, a zombie type person, Tom Cruise, like, shoots him a bunch and then the plane ends up crashing and you find out it's like because of the curse because there's definitely a curse tom cruise is very very cursed he manages to survive the crash no one else does jenny does because he gives her a parachute and she jumps up he survives the crash and you're like hmm he wakes up in a morgue which tells you everything you need to know he is so cursed so cursed at this point and he's starting having visions of his dead friend zombie that no one else can see and that's really creepy because dead friend zombie is like just chatting to him like normal dude. And I, you don't, yeah, zombies generally don't do that. So it was, it was a little unsettling. And he's having visions of Armanette coming to get him. And she's terrifying because she's obviously not dead, but very, very old. And she's zombifying people and like kissing them and I assume stealing their life force. She does that to a couple of policemen in the crash site. And, and then they go and hide in a church somewhere. Oh, so Tom Cruise goes off with Jenny to a pub and then they go and find Armanette and she tries to stab him with this knife and you find out that she's trying to stab him because he has been her chosen, like she's decided he's her chosen. And if she stabs him with this special knife with this special shiny jewel thing, he will become the living embodiment of the god Set. Have questions about all of that when we're done, Jill. And I've completely skipped Almanet's backstory. I should really write out these summaries before I go, but I feel like just ad-libbing it gives a certain amount of insanity that, that really satisfies my inner chaos goblin. But we have Almanet's backstory. She was a princess, a wonderful princess, next in line to the throne. Questions about that also. Many questions about how a princess becomes next in line to the throne. But then, oh no, her father has a son. <gasps> So as any sensible person would do, she murders her father, her brother, and her father's wife. Super, super sane thing to do. And somehow makes a pact with Set, who is super evil deity type person, and tries to have him embodied in, in her first chosen, who is killed by someone, we don't know who. And then she's captured and bound up in, in all these, these modification stuff and put in sarcophagus and suspended in the mercury pit, which we had, we already mentioned. So she's very old, 
and covered in bandages. And she's your typical like half rotted zombie mummy type person, but she's also got all of this text written on her. Questions about that? We'll get to those. So many questions. And each time she like sucks someone's soul out, she becomes a little bit more beautiful and youthful and less terrifying spider zombie mummy thing because she does this weird hands and legs crawling and it, it's very creepy. And she tries to kill Tom Cruise and then realizes, oh no, there is no gemstone in the magical knife that I have and we need the gemstone because it doesn't work otherwise. So Tom Cruise gets away, except he keeps driving in circles and going back to her. And you're like, ah, she's in your head, mate. And he's like, no, no, no. Yes, yes, she is. And there are lots of zombies. Yeah, very scary. And he gets taken to this institute. We don't really know what it is. It is run by a Mr. Jekyll. And if that doesn't ring any alarm bells for anyone, I don't know what rock you've been hiding under, who is concerned with the study of evil, because that's a thing. And evil is a like an entity that we can study and dissect and prevent from doing shit, apparently. And they've caught Almanette and she's chained up in this weird stone basement thing that's apparently under what looks like the Natural History Museum. All buildings in London, all of them have like super secret caverns way down. Yeah, it's fact, absolute fact. And we've got more mercury. Her veins are being filled with liquid mercury because apparently this will mummify her. And then when they freeze the mercury, it will immobilize her. And then they can cut her apart and dissect and, and like study her as one does with evil walking dead princesses. But the catch is, because Tom Cruise is cursed, he can't die, and he's always going to be this like potential vessel for the ultimate evil to come. So Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, decides that actually killing Tom Cruise is probably the best, the best way to go. And you're like, mm, solid plan, good, well done. At some point he turns into, into Mr. Hyde and tries to convince Tom Cruise that they should like join forces, which was very interesting. I'm not sure what they were necessarily planning on doing, and Tom Cruise is like, no, no, no. <sighs> So then obviously, because this is Hollywood, Armanette escapes. She sends one of her spider things who goes in the brain and ear hole of one of the workers who then uh, free, is all, yeah, very creepy. She frees her. She escapes. Tom Cruise and Jenny escape. There's a like chase scene with lots of sand blowing through the streets of London, which Lexi, yes, did look very cool. I enjoyed that effect very much. And there are more zombies and she brings back to life all of the crusaders. Yeah, massive crusader. And it, frankly, if I was being chased by an undead queen, princess type person, I necess probably, like, probably wouldn't head straight for the local crusader cemetery. It wouldn't be super high on my list of things to do. And admittedly, he didn't really have a lot of time to think it through, but not great. Anyway, it ends up where Jenny dies, because of course she dies. Almanette is like, she was always going to die. She was doomed from the start. You couldn't do anything. And Tom Cruise is like, oh, I will never give in. And ends up stabbing himself with the dagger because they found the stone it was in the crusader cemetery they put it back in the dagger he ends up stabbing himself i don't know why it was different for him to stab himself and for her to stab him but apparently it was because he wouldn't give her the knife and let her stab him so he stabs himself and it becomes the ultimate vessel of set as one does but then has the presence of mind that he can kill armanet like he overrides the power of set an actual god like ultimate evil Tom Cruise mm -hmm. has the fucking moral fiber to override <laughs> the will of the gods of evil and death. So, fascinating. An antiquities looter. I know, Tom I know. Bless. <laughs> there's this great cutback to, or flashback to Jenny saying, there's a good man in there somewhere. You're like, he fucking loots antiquities from a war-torn country. No, there's not. Sorry, N no. And I am admittedly biased. Yes, yeah, so he kills Armanet, brings Jenny back to life, then has this weird conversation from her in the shadows because she can't see him and tells her that he's a monster and he's hideous and he's evil because he still has set inside him. And then it kind of cuts to Jenny being back in this weird research lab with Dr. Jekyll talking about how there is a good man and he could be an asset to them. And Tom Cruise is like out in the desert with his dead best friend who is no longer dead and also no longer a mummy. And they're just riding through the desert with this massive fucking sandstorm behind them. Don't know why the sandstorm's there. Looks super cool. Not sure why it's there. And uh, you get this voiceover from Dr. Jekyll saying that he's just going to roam the earth until he finds a way to break the curse. And that's where the movie ends. So they clearly were setting it up for a sequel. There's not going to be one, I don't think, because I don't think this did super well. Yeah, that was a lot. Straight trash, but also good yeah. trash. Yeah, amusing. More amusing than some of the ones we've seen. 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely love movies that have absolutely no plot and whatever. I mean, like, if I made the original Mummy, or not the original, but, you know, the 1999 Mummy into a trilogy, you would add the Scorpion King, which is a wonderful That's, Yeah, I, I agree movie. with that. Absolutely no plot. <laughs> and, no, perfect. But wonderful. Actually, I still, I on my list is also to watch the rest of the Scorpion King movies because I've only seen number two and parts of number three. I think they're up to like five or six by now. That's a lot of <laughs> that Scorpion needs to King. Be a day. But yeah, that's it. Eh, not not my favorite. <laughs> okay, well, I want to dig right in and ask this. So the the thing that I'm I was always like, this seems for a, a movie that does not seem like it has a lot of accurate research. The like nickname, I guess let's call it for Tom Cruise that the mummy, yes, yeah, Setepi or Seti Pie, however they pronounce it. Yeah. I was like, does that actually mean what they say it does, or is yes. that just really weirdly? Actually, the one accurate thing in this movie is that the language was not bad. I could actually understand sometimes what they were trying to That's say. That's really cool. And I actually even looked, and there was no. Egyptologist that I could see listed on, I mean, maybe it was somebody who I just had never heard of, but I couldn't see anybody listed. Unlike the 1999 Mummy movie, they used Dr. Stuart Tyson Smith, who also worked on Stargate. I was going to say he did Stargate. But yeah, no, the language was actually decent. Like I could understand some of what they were saying. Actually, it was funny because I was sitting here and Sometimes what they said it said in the subtitles was not actually what they were saying. I was like, no, it slightly means this. <laughs> so, like, clearly it was somewhat accurate if I could even, in my head, like... Correct the translation correct they were the giving subtitles. you. That's really cool. That's awesome. So linked um, to that, what is the writing? It's not hieroglyphs. No, is it Coptic? I, it looks, no, it looks like they were trying to get at, like, a form of demotic or something, maybe, or even like really, really bad hieratic. I don't know. But I couldn't see that it actually said anything. So Jenny said when they uncovered the sarcophagus, Jenny's like, oh my gosh, this is New Kingdom hieroglyphs on the sarcophagus. So I would assume that Amanet is supposed to be a New Kingdom princess. When do we see demotic and hieratic being used in Egypt? Yeah, so hieratic actually we see all the way back starting right around the same time as hieroglyphs. Because... Hieratic is basically just kind of cursive hieroglyphs. As soon as you get hieroglyphs, you get people trying to make it easier to write in shorthand for day-to-day -day stuff, letters, administration. You're not going to write out a pretty hieroglyph every time you want. Or sales to, receipts. Yeah, every time you want to do basic tatsing or, you know, anything like that. You're not going to. But demotic is much, much later. Demotic doesn't start until, like, the late period. So that's, like what, 600 BCE? And this is supposed to be New Kingdom, so that's like 1500 to 1050 BCE, depending on where you are in the New Kingdom, if it's more Ramesid or whatever. Although there was at one point when she's yelling about the sarcophagus and saying it was 5,000 years old, where I was just like, mm, no. That would be like pre-dynastic, early dynastic. Pretty sure that's not what we got here. <laughs> okay, thank you. So but, possibly they're going for some kind of hieratic, but Probably it's just pretty yeah. patterns that they felt would look good. So going to the like kingship succession question, I know we have some quote unquote queens, male kings who show mm -hmm. up. I know that women could be regents for young boys. Is there like any historical precedent at all for a princess being considered next in line to the throne and then becoming no. ruler just by herself with no male guardianship? No, it was usually kind of a last resort. Yeah, like they would become a regent for a young king. There were, as you said, some that were queens in their own right. But even like the most famous Hatshepsut, Hatshepsut, right? Who maybe this was supposed to be somewhat based on her because of the whole erased from history thing. She only was a king in her own right because she was originally a regent to her stepson, Thutmose the Third, and then tried to consolidate power. So, no, she wasn't next in line. More what would happen is, even with Hatshepsut, there were other titles for queens and princesses that were very, very powerful. So, for example, one was the God's Wife of Amun, which by the late period became so powerful that basically you could not claim the kingship unless you had a relationship or 
like the God's wife of Amun or the Nets God's wife of Amun was your daughter or your niece, something like that. So that was very powerful, especially because in the early New Kingdom that had land associated with it that the king couldn't touch and things like that. But yeah, that was like its own separate thing. It wasn't the king. Yeah, so the female rulers that we do get, usually it's, yeah, a kind of a last resort after a husband has died, that sort of thing. That's not to say there weren't very powerful women, but they usually kind of had, if they were as powerful as we think they might have been, they would have also had a male ruler who sometimes may have been more of a front man. <laughs> um, but like there was always the, a yeah. guy there somewhere. Yeah. So if, if a king yeah. was going to die or was close to death or actually dead and had no male descendants, what would happen to the succession if he had a daughter? Would it go to like his brother or an uncle or another male relative, or would she be married off to someone who would then become king? Either or. Yeah, married off is also very common. So also, great example from the New Kingdom, we have this letter and we're not sure which queen it's from, but she writes to the Hittite king saying her husband, the king, has died and they're about to marry her off. Please send me a prince. And she doesn't want to. Yeah. So send me a prince so that I'll marry him and he can become king. I don't want to marry this random person that they're trying to make me marry so that he can take the throne. So they would have kept the succession some way in that way. There had to be some sort of relationship. Not always. Sometimes there was just plain up usurping. But yeah, they would have in some way tried to connect it that way. Okay, thank you. Now, I have several more questions, but I am absolutely monopolizing this recording. Lexi, do you need to jump in and, and like force me well, to shut up for a minute? Well, no, I just I had two thoughts popped into mind just as we were talking about the last couple things. The first one was, did anyone else notice the, I mean, okay, the whole thing's inaccurate, but this should or should, I don't know if it should have been accurate, but did anyone notice that our resident expert archaeologist, Jenny, did you notice that she called hieroglyphs hieroglyphics? Yes. Yeah. And I was like, she's like Jill been... absolutely noticed that. And it's it's <laughs> on her list of things. I was like, no, I mean, actually, like, I've accidentally done that sometimes, especially like teaching where kids keep saying it, then you start to say it. So what what is for people who don't know, what is the debate there or the difference between those words? Well, isn't it one's an adjective and one's a noun? Yeah. Hieroglyphic that I see. So it's... hieroglyphic writing <laughs> is the yeah. style of writing as opposed to hieroglyphs, which are the actual, the actual glyphs. glyphs, the actual images. But yeah, I mean, also though, a lot of this, yeah, is just Hollywood inaccuracies with like where she's just sitting reading off the coffin, which anybody who reads ancient languages, you're not going to sit there and just ramble off. You're going to sit there with several dictionaries and be like, does this word mean curse or temple or pants? You know, it's maybe all of the above. Ancient Egyptians loved puns. There were a lot of multiple meanings. Embark on a digital expedition unlike any other with Hit Points and History. Dive into the captivating realm of Archeogaming from the comfort of your screen at our virtual Archeogaming conference. Join academics, professionals, and gamers of all levels on an interactive journey through live streams, workshops, and collaborative gaming events. Whether you're a seasoned adventurer or just starting your quest, there's something for everyone. Your adventure awaits at Hit Points and History, March 9th through 10th. To buy tickets and find out more, head over to hitpointscon.com. That's hitpointscon, H-I-T-P-O-I-N-T-S-C-O-N, Com. From now until February 29th, use code LEAPYEAR to get 29% off. I do love it in movies when they have people just reading off the walls of ancient things. And I'm like, okay, I can do that with a couple of inscriptions in the Met because they're super formulaic and you, know, you just know what they say. I would not be able to walk into the field, uncover a random artifact from God knows what time period, and just give an accurate translation the first time I saw it. You have to be like in the 50th year of your career or something for that to be even viable. Well, and like, yeah, some very simple things. Yeah, of course. Again, like with where they were speaking, often they were saying what seemed to be very basic sentences. Yeah, like setup E or setup I, however they pronounced it. Setup means to choose. So 
I is the suffix pronoun for first person singular. So my chosen. Sure. So a lot of that, yes. Again, while I was watching it, I could in my head even know what those words are. But yeah, for a long inscription, especially like now granted also a lot of like so coffin, sarcophagi, that sort of thing, they'll often be more formulaic. But the entire point of this was that it wasn't supposed to be. It was supposed to be so unusual. That's going to be something you're going to actually like research, right? <laughs> Especially if you think this might be your, like the defining moment of your career because you've been searching yeah. for this like lost princess for years and you, you also, think you found her, maybe like just take a beat and make sure you're yeah. accurate before you start getting super excited. Yeah. But also with that, when they said like this lost princess erased from history, I was sitting here chuckling because I was like, we don't know most of the names of these king's kids. They had too many of them. I mean, freaking Ramses II had at least a hundred kids. <laughs> we don't know their names. <laughs> what do you mean lost? He didn't history? just keep a list that we could find for like Christmas <laughs> yeah. presents or something. Yeah, like there is no list that they were stricken off of. No. And that was my problem with like, well, that is my problem with all the biblical like Exodus story stuff because I always attribute it to like Ramesses. And so mm -hmm. in one of the Exodus stories we were watching at some point, it was really funny because I was like, because they made such a big deal, you know, death of the firstborn son. And then Pharaoh's so sad because now he has no heir. And I'm like, dude, the man firstborn has like a hundred. I was like, yeah, he had like a hundred children. This should have not been a thing, but okay. You need it to serve your story, your narrative. So that was interesting. I mean, okay. And then the other thing that I was thinking about was kind of like the way that the movie handled the portrayal of the Middle East. I mean, obviously you have the colonialists coming in and like, you know, blowing up shit. I had to make a parallel, yeah. but it was like ISIS. It was like coming in, blowing shit up. The insurgents are coming mm -hmm. and you're like, I don't care. Let's just blow up the site because we need to move. It's like done sloppily all in the name of war. And then the fact that like you have your protagonist, one supposedly being an archaeologist who should essentially know how permits work and how you have to, you know, approach members of like a different culture. So the fact that they were rendered really like careless kind of about mm -hmm. this i was very less than pleased and then also when they like bring her back the only thought was like why is she in natural history like wouldn't a more fitting place for this long dead apparently mysterious great find shouldn't it have been in the british museum like if we're yeah. gonna be accurate british about museum. some things but not others it, to me it's like a glaring omission that if you're gonna be accurate about sort of the state of colonialism being alive and well especially with the uk british museum is a more obvious choice yeah like we all want to make the bm yeah. like the big offender so like let them be take her yeah. there also oh. like british museum you could have just had multiple mummies following her <laughs> right so i'm like why the fuck like just put the fucking jekyll yeah. institute under there like it's just re really unclear no but actually like one of the things that I think I hated most about this movie was to me there were just no sympathetic characters. <laughs> like I didn't like I disliked anybody. All of them. Yeah, like who am I supposed to root for? Yeah, the freaking looter? No. Weirdly, Armanet <laughs> was the most sympathetic character. Yes, yeah, I felt the, terrible. I was like, oh honey, you deserve so much more. I mean, yes, yeah, murder the, is bad, so don't kill your like baby brother and your father and your family, but like also different times. So maybe you know, she gets a pass. Well, I mean, I think more she might get a pass because if you remember, actually, first she made the deal with Set and I kind of could see like she made the deal with Set thinking, I just want to get power, not kill everybody. But <laughs> And then she was turned to the, I mean, because also the treatment of Set is just weird. That, that was my next question. And I'm going to just like force myself into your flow of thought because so hmm, Set as an Egyptian deity. Mm -hmm. Like, what was his role? And was he seen as this, like, super evil? I'm assuming he wasn't seen as this super evil dude. Okay, so yes and no. So, first of all, like, the god of death, that's a super Western notion. Like, that's, like, whole things, like, Satan and things. No. Now, granted, though, if you're gonna make a pact with anybody, any of the Egyptian pantheon to kill your baby brother, it would definitely be set. Because he is the god who killed his brother to get the throne of Egypt. So, I mean, if she didn't actually mean to go the whole murderous route, I could see him planting that idea. 
he literally in Egyptian mythology, his brother Osiris was king of the earth and he killed him to try to steal the throne. Of course, you know, because everything ended up hunky-dory, the throne ended up going to Osiris' son, Horus, who was the god of kingship. But Set was more kind of a god of chaos and deserts. And, I mean, if you're actually going to say the god of death, usually they say Osiris because he was king of the underworld. He was the first god to ever die. And so he became ruler of the underworld. Is, is he, sorry, he was, he's typically depicted as a mummy. Yes. Is he, yeah. Yeah. Because as part of the mythology, after Seth killed him, at least in some versions of the story, he then chopped up his body and spread his body throughout Egypt or throughout the world. And then Isis found all the different pieces of his body, Isis being Osiris's sister wife, and brought them all together, wrapped them all up, and kind of that was the origin of why you wanted to be mummified to associate yourself with Osiris. But yeah, this whole god of death thing is weird. Again, though, if you're going to make a pact with anybody, kill your baby brother. Definitely Set. But Set also, especially in the New Kingdom, had a flip side where he was also the protector of the god Ra. And he actually, in the underworld, would fight another god of chaos, Apep, who was a giant snake, and protect Ra. He was the protector of Ra. So he wasn't all bad. <laughs> there so was the whole... Yeah, fight with Horus, and that was a big thing, but... So he's not someone who would necessarily want to destroy all of creation or something? No, no. I mean, yeah, he was super bitter about not getting the throne of Egypt, but he kind of accepted things later on. Now, granted, the contendings of Horus and Seth, which talks about the back and forth between the two, is one of the most messed up stories you're ever going to read. <laughs> um, but... I mean, in most cultures in the ancient world, gods were kind of almost human, right? They had pros and cons, good and bad. They acted like humans would. So he's definitely not this all-consuming evil. I mean, actually, if you're going to pick an all-consuming evil, that would have been Apep, the snake god in the underworld. So I feel like Seth is just kind of like a Loki. Like, I'm here to cause chaos and shit, but also, like, I don't actually want permanent bad stuff so i feel like you know he'll he'll step up and be like okay i'll do some good mm -hmm. until everything is fine and then i can go back to doing my like tricksy sort of chaos thing but yeah. yeah and he was a chaos god that was like his main role so yeah he did bear quite a resemblance to loki actually okay yeah. so in egyptian mythology do gods ever need this and i can't even believe i'm asking this because the answer is just no but i would like you to talk about it did gods ever need to like inhabit mortal bodies to do shit because the whole point of tom cruise being the chosen one is so sets can inhabit his body and use it as a vessel because he apparently can't do anything in the mortal world without having a, a mortal body yeah no first of all yeah gods could definitely act in the mortal world now that being said the idea of like a god inhabiting a human that's not that weird because priests actually would dress up as certain gods, especially Anubis. We have images of them like wearing an Anubis mask and that sort of thing. And then there were priestesses who tried to associate themselves with Hathor. There was clearly like some rituals where they probably were acting as Hathor in some of the myths. So the idea of like connecting a human with a god and that being a magical religious experience that's not that weird but yeah the idea that he needed a human in order to do anything no like people actually especially later periods they actually like wrote letters to the gods asking them to do stuff for them so yeah they could definitely do stuff why he would need a human no idea something that came up for me that i actually really forgot about to even mention in the in the beginning as we were talking about it but i'll mention it now the ruby the ruby that is supposed to be the all wonderful ruby yeah. that you attach if i remember my history correctly rubies didn't come into egypt until like the roman period when they brought yeah. all their bedazzled everything and then bedazzled egypt which is my kind of mm -hmm. fun joke but yeah just any any reason like why they would pick a ruby like after they came into egypt yeah. was there a special connotation given to them i was just like why did they not use like black onyx or like lapis lazuli or just like something that would actually have been found in egypt 
Yeah, no, that confused me too. I think they just were trying to go for like blood red, but um, that would be my assumption. in Egypt, yeah, if they wanted a red stone, they used carnelian, not ruby. Yeah, as you're completely right, rubies didn't come in until way later. Now, granted, because Set was also a god of the desert, he was associated with the color red because the desert was actually called the Redland, Desheret, which is, you know, arguably where we get the word desert from today. But yeah, that was, I think, just for pretty sparkling special effects. <laughs> That's just like... To have it shine off the stone. <laughs> I mean, it makes it sense. very pretty. But, it's... Ugh, yeah. but I'm like, ugh, goodbye accuracy. But sure, you know what? Let's go with it. There doesn't seem to be a lot of people. You know, I think I realized there was like one scene that was like Egypt and that was like the CGI thing mm. on the Giza Plateau. Because I remember looking up where they filmed the movie. They filmed in like the Namibian desert and then in the UK. Okay. So I was like, wow, you didn't even film in Egypt. You're talking about Egypt. And yet you have like one scene and it's like a CGI version. This is very well i think that was also because especially like that last shot where you know they're riding off towards the pyramids if you've ever been to giza you can't really get that shot where it's just desert and the pyramids because cairo is right there so i think that's part of why they did that because they wanted it to be like out in the middle of nowhere in the desert that's just not what it is anymore i mean arguably it was never that far out i mean Part of the reason that Giza and all those places were chosen was because they were close enough to Memphis, the capital city at the time. And that's Old Kingdom, not, you know, later in the New Kingdom, which presumably that's when this is. Then the capital would have been in Thebes, Valley of the Kings, that sort of thing. So, I mean, my only thing is I'm like, look, man, if you're going to use such heavy CGI, film Egypt and CGI out Cairo. There you go. Yeah, that would have been definitely an option. But yeah, it is just bizarre that, yeah, the one time they're actually in Egypt is like at the very end. <laughs> right. I'm like, what is this? So I don't know. Like, it's it's very confusing. But on its own, the Egyptian stuff, you're like, OK, it's not super accurate. It's weird. Whatever. But I'm like, why do they have to tie in Jekyll and Hyde? Like, we're. Well, that I do know why they did that, because they were trying to use this as a start for an entire universe, the dark universe. So it was going to be the beginning of an entire movie central, like the Marvel series. And that kind of taint, although they're still trying. Actually, I was researching this after watching the movie. And what's kind of sad is they've actually done a couple more movies that are supposed to be in this universe. One of which, The Invisible Man came out in 2020. I never heard that it actually happened, even though it actually had like one of my favorite actors, Aldous Hodge. And it got really good reviews, but... I've never even heard of it. The Invisible Man, 2020. And that's part of this whole universe. And that's also supposedly why they had Jekyll and Hyde in there, because it was supposed to be part of this whole new horror franchise. Oh, so, okay, okay, that but makes... This movie that, killed that. <laughs> gives a satisfying explanation to his very bizarre presence. I enjoyed him as a character. It was uh, Russell Crowe mm -hmm. doing a, a great job being alternatively smarmy Creepy. and unsettling and just downright Creepy. mean and violent. Yeah, creepy. But I had no idea why he yeah, was Yeah, and that's also why they ended it on the bizarre notion of like Tom Cruise writing off, because it was supposed to have a sequel, as you said earlier. Mm. It's supposed to be part of this new dark universe, which just hasn't really taken off because this was supposed to be the first installment, and it did not do well. So Yeah, unsurprisingly, I mean, this is just bizarre. But I mean, yes, that, that helps contextualize it it makes it a bit easier to understand but yeah i don't know there's there's a lot wrong there's a lot wrong here in so many ways also my criticism for the last movie we did as well was that the casting was like the furthest from being accurate mm -hmm. i mean okay it takes place a lot in like the uk so fine you can have like white people running around i found it interesting that the mummy herself Sophia Vutala is Algerian French, I believe. So I'm like, right. okay, so she's like of some African <laughs> heritage. Yeah. And then she's, she's not white. <laughs> she's not white. And then the guy who played her father, the Pharaoh, 
I believe he's of like Tamil descent or something. So I'm like, yeah, he is. So I'm like, okay, India, but also like India is like far from Egypt. So that really is not, but okay, great. Yeah. Kudos for not having white people there, but yeah, it's, <laughs> but that's just bad. It's just bad. I mean, it's not hard. Like there are Egyptian actors like, you oh, know, yeah. yeah. There are wonderful Egyptian actors who could have done that very well. Right. Although the one time you do get like an Egyptian actor, right, it's in like the wrong type of movie. Because I remember when they cast Mina Masood in the remake live action Aladdin, I was like, oh, my God, he's Egyptian. I'm like, why? This is like Arabia. Mm -hmm. Like cast the Egyptian <laughs> dude in an Egyptian thing and cast like an arabian actor <laughs> in the arabian th i was like what i don't hollywood is weird and it gives me a headache sometimes because i'm like this is so why why i whatever but you know what the casting of annabelle wallace as your british archaeologist was spot on she's some like blonde haired white chick being mm -hmm. Kind of being not all British good... and colonial and removing things <laughs> from uh, Mesopotamia. Yeah, and just like yeah, not a as good... an archaeologist, though, why was she removing things? <laughs> right, I was like, if yes, you're the archaeologist who's like supposed to be the expert, I'm like, why are you doing things that make archaeologists cringe? Like, oh, why couldn't she have been like, no, we should leave this here and then fine, be like, make it like Tom Cruise, like. We're going to leave the site, so we don't care what you say. We're taking it anyway. You could have at least had her, like, protest, protest, protest until it was, like, clearly removed. And then she'll be like, okay, fine, let's study it if it's here. But, like, she was all, let's go. And I'm like, She's like, I'm not yeah. leaving without this as it happens. Yeah, so. exactly. Right? So <laughs> it's you are just the worst. Yeah. No, again, no sympathetic characters in this whole movie. <laughs> Wait, can we talk about the shitty romance? The romance that had about as much chemistry yes. as the Twilight yes. romance? There was no chemistry. Absolutely no chemistry. And like, I fully believe her throwaway comment at the beginning that the sets was very short-lived because no chemistry. <laughs> okay, I want to know, do you think that their chemistry was better or worse than like Twilight chemistry? I think it might have been worse. Oh, yeah, <laughs> just, I think wow, so. That one was so bad. It was so bad. Yeah, but also at least with, granted, at least with Twilight, I think that was like forced bad. Because like It was supposed to be weird and those, awkward and uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah since we, then we've learned all of those actors can actually do chemistry and everything. So... Okay, yeah. So they get And also it. that one was always supposed to be creepy. I mean, you've got a really old vampire obsessed with a teenage girl. Like if you make that too good, that's not sending. That's not good. No, <laughs> but you know, I dispute that only because the Vampire Diaries, which came out in 2009, so the year I like started high school with all my friends, so it was like our ritual we would watch the Vampire Diaries together because we were the right age. They were in high school, we were in high school. But like mm -hmm. again, 200 and like 50 whatever year old vampire creepily being like obsessed with teenage girl <laughs> but like mm -hmm. paul wesley and nina dobrev had fantastic chemistry and then we were all like sucked into the oh, and it's so romantic and it's so sweet and we love them yeah. and it's amazing so i'm like look those are two examples of you can have the same creepy ass storyline well, yeah buffy i mean look at buffy right angel and Snake. absolutely all the chemistry right no it's such a trope so i'm like look man i know it's supposed to be awkward in twilight but i'm like that was just really awkward so I, if it was the direction or the comfort level of the actors i don't know what it was but yeah that one was just bad so if you have a romance that's worse, worse. than that <laughs> then you know you're doing something real but like no wonder this movie was a bomb like you could have had such bad everything but you know what? if the chemistry and the romance was like actually good that could have mm -hmm. saved it a few notches yeah definitely could. i mean like yeah even like with the scorpion king at least there was chemistry there <laughs> right so there was a lot of chemistry in that movie oh my god like, every time you see like fucking dwayne johnson and kelly who likes like making eyes at each other you're like yeah. ooh, ooh, you're you're having like mind sex or something it's like yeah. insane. Oh, one thousand percent i mean that movie is like the one movie where it's totally okay that both of the main characters are 
very scantily clad all the time because you're <laughs> you're there for it <laughs> like it's good it's fine i'm <laughs> all for no scantily reason. clad people as long as you have fucking amazing chemistry then it just <laughs> makes sense that in our minds you should be just like flying together into a dramatic kiss at every moment you can. oh yeah with the moon <laughs> and then okay, so i'm coming. learning from this conversation is we need to put scorpion king on our list for a future yes. episode and yes. just get jill back I mean, Yes. Yeah. Also, if I have an excuse to again watch like one through five or six or whatever number there are right now, <laughs> unfortunately, Dwayne Johnson was only in the first one, and after that, he was recast. I was so but... sad. I was so sad. I was there yeah. because I was there for the chemistry between Kelly Who and and Dwayne Johnson, and then he was replaced. Mm -hmm. And then I admit I actually stopped after the first one because I was like, nope, I refuse. This is in my memory is the best. Yeah. I definitely watched the second one. I think I've seen pieces of the third one, but the second one was already so bad. I want to see how it can get worse. I mean, from Mesopotamia, they somehow end up in like an underground thing and end up in the uh, labyrinth. <laughs> like they go oh, underneath yeah. the Mediterranean or something. It's very bizarre. I might be misremembering, but I just remember sitting there being like, what is happening? I mean, look, <laughs> and this was accuracy yeah, this in like, like in high school. yeah accuracy in like ancient world things is just not even so you know half the time you just gotta let go and be like you know what if you tunnel underground and somehow end up in like crete with daedalus's mm -hmm. labyrinth go for it man yeah. <laughs> go for it enjoy the journey yes yeah. exactly so so okay. i'm gonna pull us back to the mummy because we have like five minutes left and i sure. know we kind of covered our usual last question at the beginning, but I want to just go through it again. Is this something either of you would recommend to anyone else to watch, either just as a movie or as a piece of Egyptian reception? Egyptian? No. <laughs> as a movie, if you want something really, really dumb, I guess, I don't... Eh. With me, I don't know. I think there are better things, again, like I would much more recommend like Scorpion King or something. <laughs> but... Yeah. I mean, would you watch it again? Maybe just because I got so annoyed and frankly, like halfway through the movie, even paused, like how much of this is like, damn it, there's like another hour. <laughs> so I might have to rewatch it because I might have missed some things. But other than that, no. <laughs> well, I can say confidently that having watched it about three or four times, there's like nothing that you missed. Really, that was kind of it. <laughs> <laughs> but i don't know like there's something that keeps me coming back to like shitty reception movies and i don't know if it's because yeah. it's like i mean for me a lot of what determines like if i enjoy something to be quite honest is actors and their performances and like do i like these actors do i like generally what they bring to the screen so I would say, I mean, I really love Sofia Boutella and I love her work generally. Mm -hmm. And even when she's, this is like the proof of when she's given something terrible and awful and like just why, she really made something out of the role. She, she did made a good job. Own. She was genuinely unsettling and Yeah, like she like scary. just, I mean, she just went with it and was like, you know what? I got to lean into the crazy. And mm -hmm. that is to me like the ultimate sign of awesome acting chops. And I do love seeing that. And so, yeah, that's why like this is one that I don't think I would watch it alone. Like I haven't really watched it alone more than twice. I watched it the first time and then this time, the other times watch it with people. So I think it's again going to be one of those. If someone else wants to watch it with me, I'll watch it because again, so bad it's yeah. good. But yeah, I mean, I've just, I've, I've had my fill alone, but you know, if you want a dumb movie that has some weird Egyptianizing elements, sure, I'll say, fine, watch this. But although after doing a master's in cultural heritage stuff, I'm less likely only because going back and seeing the treatment of the sites and artifacts and stuff, I'm even less than thrilled. Yeah, I mean, for me also, yeah, just, again, there's just no sympathetic characters. And yeah, the treatment of looting that it's like totally okay. I mean, we get like one rebuke from the general saying, oh, you're using this for profiteering. But other than that, it's treated as totally cool. Yeah, so uh, that no. is not fun. And I am more sensitive now after literally writing a master's on this kind of thing. So I don't know, I, I guess I would recommend if you want a stupid movie to just watch something because you're bored. Sure. I think if 
I wanted like a stupid movie just to watch because I'm bored. I'm more likely to go with Gods and Kings. Oh, the yeah, ridiculousness is is more entertaining. And I know when we discussed it, I was very rude about the movie, and it's awful. But I think it fulfills the so bad it's good far more than this one does. This this yeah. was fine. It's just it wasn't terribly good as a piece of cinematography. The plot wasn't massively compelling, and the reception was wonky. <laughs> Yeah, see, I I knew it. I knew as we got on in the season, Megan, I was like, I bet she's going to come to look at Gods and Kings much more charitably. Because for me, I actually do. I, I've watched it enough times to be like, I actually fucking love it, even though it's terrible, <laughs> but it's so bad that it's so good. And the acting is hilarious. And I get eye candy because so many of the people are hot. So I actually have turned from hating it to loving it. So I'm like, I'm slowly watching Megan follow my path into Gods and Kings is actually good. Bad good, but good. I was going to say for a very, very narrow definition of the word good. Bad good. It's, it's bad good. We should probably wrap up there mainly because I have children waking up and they're going to start being here <laughs> very soon. <laughs> <laughs> but Jill, thank you so much for doing this. It was really fun. Yeah, definitely. And I'm happy to come back again. This was very fun. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a review. And you can also follow us on social media at The Reading Party Podcast. If you'd like to leave us a book or movie suggestion, then email us at thereadingpartypod at gmail.com. See you next week.